Welcome to the fourth lecture in week uh, two of the kinetic theory of gases. Today we'll be looking at the transport properties of gases, in particular effusion and diffusion, and we'll be looking at the thermal conductivity of gases as well. So let's jump straight in. So now we can uh, use the considerations uh, developed in previous lectures to calculate the number of impacts yeah, that occur per unit time and per unit area. So that means the collision number uh, of gas molecules against, for example, the wall of a pressurized vessel. Yeah? And uh, we start by considering the pressure dpx perpendicular to the surface A. Yeah? So this is uh, the pressure along the x-axis. Yeah? So this gives us uh, the pressure equals to dpx divided by A by dt. And this is essentially equivalent to the number density of particles times kt. Yeah? And this is essentially equivalent uh, to the ideal gas law yeah? uh, with the number density of particles equals Avogadro's number divided by the molar volume. Yeah? So now in the time dt we have essentially particles hitting the surface A here yeah? from directions Vx, Vy and Vz. Yeah? So dn is dependent on Vx, Vy and Vz. Yeah, since we're now moving in three-dimensional space. So now we can essentially express uh, the, the, this number of particles hitting the surface uh, in a time dt by the number density of particles times the surface area A times the modulus of Vx times dt. Yeah, and all of this coming from three different directions. This is nVx by n times dVx times nVy by n times dVy times nVz by n dVz. Yeah? So uh, to get uh, to the total number of collisions yeah, that are coming from all directions, uh, we again have to integrate yeah, these expressions here uh, over all positive Vx, yeah, so these are the particles that are coming towards the surface. So this is our integral from zero to infinity of dvx. Uh, and all positive and negative vy and vz values. Yeah? So here, this is the expression here, 2.33, that describes it. Yeah? So now again, we know Vx, Vy, and Vz are independent because they lie along the principal axes. And um, the integrals um, over these functions dependent on uh, Vy and Vz uh, are equal to the square root yeah, of 2 pi kt over m. Yeah? So that uh, we essentially get here uh, our expression 2.34. Yeah, so this is dn equals to the number density times the area times dt times the square root of m divided by 2 pi, 2 pi kt. Yeah? And we still have this integral uh, between 0 and infinity for dvx to do. Yeah? So again, uh, we can separate all the variables and substitute, uh, uh, substitute for Vx, yeah, the, our old expression, which you remember from the previous times, yeah, square root m um, divided by 2kt, yeah, times the modulus of Vx. So this is this expression here, yeah. So again, what do we achieve by this? Well, we get this integral into a form which we know, yeah, and this is uh, the integral from zero to infinity of u times e to the power of minus u squared by du. Yeah? So this entire integral here has a value of one half. So from the integral of equation 2.35, we can now get uh, our collision number per unit time and unit area. And this is expressed here in equation 2.36. So our collision number um, for gas species 1, yeah, Zw equals dn 
over ADT, yeah, or from the integral, it is equal to the number density times KT over 2 pi M um, to the power of one half, or square root of all of that. Yeah? Uh, and if we consider now uh, this relationship for the mean velocity, yeah, from this equation 1.31 from lecture 2, we can now also introduce pressure and uh, mean velocity or average velocity into this expression of a collision number. Yeah? So now, uh, when we obtain uh, for the number of impacts per unit time on the unit area of a wall, uh, we get ex uh, equation 2.37. Yeah? So Zw equals uh, pressure over square root of 2 pi mkt equals 1 quarter times the number density of particles times the mean velocity equals 1 quarter Avogadro's number divided by the molar volume times the mean velocity. Yeah. So this relationship is of great importance yeah, in the calculation of surface reactions, yeah, for example in heterogeneous catalysis, um, and for the treatment of the effusion of gases. Yeah, in, in the latter case, uh, the effusion velocity, yeah, um, that means the particle flow uh, exiting through an opening of a so-called Knudsen cell, as we saw previously, is of interest. Yeah? And you've seen an example of a Knudsen cell um, in lecture two. Yeah? So this is uh, essentially a reactor with one opening and you have these apertures through which a particle beam can escape. So uh, the, this particle flow yeah, of escaping particles can now be uh, calculated directly from equation 2.37, yeah, because it is essentially identical with a number of particles hitting the area A yeah, of, a, um, uh, of the opening in any given unit of time. So now let's compare this expression here uh, to our simple gas model that we introduced in lecture one. Yeah? So you can see this was a gas model back in the day um, uh, here in equation 1.2 and uh, both these equations essentially differ by a factor of uh, three halves. Yeah? And this is simply because uh, um, in our previously very naive model we only assumed movement of particles along the uh, principal axes x, y, z. Yeah? Now we consider three-dimensional movement so uh, we should have used uh, the modulus of Vx yeah, instead of V. Uh, but again, uh, previously we've made some very simplistic assumptions. Yeah, the principal model essentially holds true. So we now come to the discussion um, of the actual transport phenomena like effusion and diffusion. Yeah? But also uh, internal friction can be derived from these relationships, thermal conductivity and the electrical conductivity of gases. Yeah? So what's the difference between effusion and diffusion? Yeah? On the left hand side um, we see in the schematic uh, a representation of effusion yeah, through a hole that is smaller in size than the mean free path yeah, of the molecules that are traveling through it. Yeah, and on the right hand side uh, uh, we have a larger hole yeah, and this allows diffusion. Yeah, that means several molecules can pass the hole simultaneously and also in both directions. Yeah? And in general, um, uh, for this purpose, we will consider stationary non-equilibrium states. Yeah? That means those states in which the same non-equilibrium position is always maintained in the system. Yeah? So that there is always a gradient. Yeah? Um, uh, during the duration of the experiment. And yeah, we can achieve this essentially uh, by this Knudsen type setup, as we uh, now several times described. Yeah? Um, so uh, the Knudsen type setup essentially um, consists of two reservoirs, reservoir one and reservoir two. Yeah? And the system of interest, this is where things happen, where they diffuse or effuse. Um, 
and essentially uh, uh, reservoir one um, allows uh, continuously allows the transport of matter yeah in the case of, of particles or uh, any other transport for example of heat or uh, over the duration of the experiment yeah into the system and reservoir two uh, continuously takes up a corresponding amount of a transport quantity, for example, gas molecules from the system. Yeah? And further, as I said previously, yeah, we, we're working under stationary non-equilibrium states. That means essentially the potential difference, for example, chemical potential difference um, is maintained and there is a chemical potential difference within the system. Yeah. So now under uh, the influence of um, this chemical potential gradient, yeah, we have uh, essentially a balance, balancing process that occurs. Yeah, and this occurs, for example, by transport of gas molecules. Yeah? And we call um, the transport quantity, yeah, we refer to the transport quantity, as uh, the transported matter and denoted with a capital gamma yeah and this is related uh, um, to molecular quantities yeah so molecular transport quantity uh, with gamma dash yeah so now we have essentially a flux of particles yeah or of a transport quantity gamma um, that is transported in a time dt through a hole with the area A, yeah? Divided by, divide all of this by ADT, and we get essentially the uh, flux, you have a directional flux J uh, of gamma, um, which we describe here by, by this equation, yeah? Which is essentially minus A times the gradient of this transport quantity, yeah? And with uh, uh, and a in this particular case is our transport coefficient. So again, this sounds all very academic, but we'll come to a couple of examples where uh, the same relationship will ap apply throughout. So just keep this in mind. Now, going from reservoir one to reservoir two via the system, yeah, this is the direction of transport. Um, we assume that the transport quantity gamma changes along the z coordinate. Yeah. Hence, we can write um, a gradient for the system, d gamma by dz, so this is along the z-axis. Um, and uh, so this, uh, this means essentially that gamma is independent of x and y. Yeah? And it also means that gamma increases, yeah? so the transport quantity gamma increases as z increases. Yeah? And we can we also find uh, that at a certain point z zero the gradient is uh, d gamma by d z times z zero. Yeah. Now we are only interested in the velocity component of the particles. Yeah. In that velocity component that is lying in the direction of the z axis. Yeah. Furthermore, we assume that collisions between the particles only take place in certain planes, yeah, perpendicular to the z-axis. Yeah, and these uh, planes uh, are spaced out by a distance that is uh, just the Max, uh, uh, Maxwell's uh, mean free path. Yeah, so lambda m. Yeah, so this is essentially an analogy to the problem that we set out in lecture three. Yeah. We can now think uh, of this problem as a gas molecule passing a number of planes with holes. Yeah? So in this figure, uh, we have essentially planes at um, zero minus lambda m. Yeah? So Maxwell's uh, um, mean free path lower and z0 plus lambda m. Yeah? So Maxwell's uh, uh, mean free path higher yeah and uh, during collisions yeah we also assume that there is a complete reversal of transport quantity so it means if there is an impact if you don't hit the hole here yeah with surface a you immediately reverse the transport quantity which means the heat or 
the molecule simply goes back yeah fully under full conservation okay so now uh, um, we ask for the resulting flux yeah onto surface a yeah so uh, the flux um, is essentially equal to the number of particles hitting the hole yeah this hole uh, with surface a in the plane at z0 yeah and times the transport quantity of the particles so uh, if the mean particle velocity is uh, v dash yeah um, and the number density of particles is 1n then we get along the z direction um, a flux of one quarter times the number density 1n times v dash times a times dt particles yeah in it so it means this is the amount of particles passing at a time uh, over a time dt onto the surface uh, uh, with an area a yeah from top and from bottom yeah so uh, the, uh, uh, the transport quantities yeah that are hitting this uh, surface a from top and bottom are then given by equations 2.40 and 2.41 yeah so this is from the top yeah so this is essentially coming from uh, uh, gamma z0 plus uh, d uh, gamma by uh, dz yeah at z0 times lambda m yeah and this is essentially minus so this is coming from the lower plane so the total flux yeah in the direction of this gradient lambda um, through the plane at z0 yeah so essentially the flux from top and from bottom um, is, is obtained by subtracting equation 2.40 yeah and equation 2.41 yeah and dividing all of this by adt so this is what exactly what we've done here so the total flux is essentially top minus bottom and all of this divided by adt yeah so for the total flux we essentially get here uh, equation 2.42 this is minus one half times the number density times v dash times lambda m times uh, our gradient yeah which is essentially d uh, uh, mean gamma by dz at z0 all right so now we have essentially a minus sign here yeah because the flow occurs in the direction of a gradient yeah so from equation 2.42 we find that the flux yeah the flux j uh, is proportional to the density of the particles the mean velocity of the particles the mean free path length yeah and the gradient of the transport size so now the transport quantity is the gas itself yeah so that means uh, the only thing that is being transported from uh, between reservoir one and two are gas particles and we speak of diffusion yes yeah, so we don't transfer any energy so let's imagine uh, uh, this as let's say a cylindrical vessel yeah, and it's initially divided uh, along the z direction yeah, by some sort of partition yeah, into two chambers um, and these chambers are filled with two different gases one and two yeah both are, both gases have the same temperature and under the same pressure so now if we remove the wall yeah the, these two gases will mix spontaneously yeah as long as we uh, as long as uh, this mixing is not complete yeah or as long as we artificially maintain the stationary non-equilibrium state um, uh, there will be a concentration gra a gradient for both gases along the z direction right um, and we can represent uh, this yeah by the gradients of the particle number densities yeah so we can express this as d1 n1 yeah over dz so along the z direction and d1 of gas 2 uh, uh, over dz yeah again uh, as we remove this barrier here between uh, these two um, these two different gases uh, we will observe a particle flu a flux of gases one and two yeah 
So this particle flux J uh, can be expressed um, for each gas essentially as the uh, number of particles DN, uh, DNI. So for the gas 1 it's DN1 and for gas 2 it's DN2 um, traveling in a time DT through surface A. Yeah? So perpendicular to the z-axis. So it means we divide dn1 by adt. Yeah? So these are equations 243 and 244. And these two equations are called uh, fixed first law. Yeah? Um, and they can be essentially expressed along the z-direction using a proportionality coefficient. Yeah? So this proportionality coefficient is uh, generally expressed as dij, which means the Diffusion coefficient dij yeah, for the diffusion of a substance i into a substance j. Okay. So uh, now, uh, if we want to relate this diffusion coefficient to the mean free path length, yeah, we can essentially use uh, this general transport equation 2.42, which we saw in previous slides. So if we apply the general transport equation yeah, to the mass as a transport quantity, um, this will give us here equation 2.45. So this is the mass flux J M uh, M I yeah, of a species I, which is expressed as DMI over ADT, and this is uh, equal to minus a half the number density times uh, mean velocity times the mean free path lambda times dmi over dz at z0. So right now uh, the transport quantity gamma is related to one molecule. Yeah? And uh, uh, this, this fraction here, dmi by dz, gives us um, the gradient of the mass i yeah, per particle. So mi uh, right now is only a computational Quantity, yeah, without real physical meaning, yeah, because uh, mi dash has the unit uh, uh, simply here mass i, yeah, per particle, yeah. So the gradient um, of a number density is then given by equation two four six, yeah. So this is essentially uh, uh, the flux mi. Uh, is equals to M, mi times dni by adt equals minus a half 1n the number density times uh, mean velocity times lambda m times m1 by 1n times in brackets d1ni by dz at z equal uh, at z0 yeah so if we divide uh, this uh, by the mass of a particle mi, uh, then we get from the mass flow yeah, to the particle flow or particle flux here in equation 2.47. Yeah, so this is essentially our particle flux jni, yeah, which is equal to dni by adt equals minus a half uh, average velocity or mean velocity times uh, the mean free path times d1ni over dz at z0. Yeah. So compare this uh, with Flick's first law. Uh, sorry, with Flick's first law. Um, uh, this is equation 243. Yeah. And we can essentially get now an expression for the diffusion coefficient. Yeah. Um, uh, as essentially a half v dash uh, times our mean free path lambda m. So these relationships have very practical implications. For example, when we look at the separation of gas molecules. Yeah, so we, we saw in the previous lectures um, how to calculate the number of impacts per unit time on the unit area of a wall. Yeah, so this was our 1zw, yeah, here expressed in equation 2.37. Now uh, we can get uh, to the absolute numbers, yeah, by multiplying uh, the numerator here and the denominator by Avogadro's number Na, yeah, um, and expressing essentially uh, uh, equation 237 uh, as a number of collisions per unit time 
um, t. Yeah, so we essentially get dn over dt equals zw times a equals p a n a by square root of two pi big M R T. Yeah. So now uh, we can apply this to a mix of gases A and B. Yeah. And we get for the relative collision flux. Yeah. So the relative collision flux of Z A over Z B. Yeah. We get the square root of uh, the mass of uh, particles B divided by the square root of the mass of particles A. Yeah, and this is uh, this relationship here because everything else essentially falls out. And this essentially here is uh, is uh, described as Graham's law. Yeah. So now uh, when we have a mixture at a given temperature, then we can say um, that the molecules of that mixture have the same kinetic energy. Yeah, since that's the energy contribution that varies with with temperature. The, uh, all the other things being equal. Yeah. Assume now in the example here um, that we have uh, a molecule A, yeah, and it is 25 times uh, the mass of molecule B. Yeah. So under our assumption that all molecules have the same kinetic energy, yeah. So this is here, ma times va squared equals mb times vb squared. Uh, we find that um, molecule B yeah, uh, is moving at five times the speed of molecules A. Yeah? So this means also that molecule B is five times more likely to hit any opening or any hole of area A yeah, if such a hole is introduced into this gas container. Yeah? So this is essentially given by this uh, relative collision flux ZA over ZB equals square root mb uh, over square root of 25 mb. And now you know why I chose 25, because it's an easy square root to take, so we've got uh, essentially 1 over 5. Okay, so uh, and this simple relationship here expressed in Graham's law uh, was the basis uh, for the Manhattan Project. Yeah, And uh, here uh, they were using um, essentially porous membranes, yeah, separators in, in this cascade process, which you see depicted here. And this cascade process uh, was used to separate uranium-238 from uranium-235. Yeah? So in nature, um, uranium is found predominantly as uranium-238. Yeah? So you have essentially um, something like 99 point something percent uranium-238. Yeah, and you have uh, slightly less than 1% uranium-235 and a very, very small amount of uranium-234 as well. So this is 0.0056% or something. Yeah? Now uranium-235 um, is the only naturally occurring fissile isotope. Yeah? And that is the one used in nuclear power plants and in nuclear weapons. Yeah? So in the case of uranium separation, the average collision flux um, of isotope uh, uh, 235 to isotope 236 is essentially square root of 238 divided by square root of 235, and this is 1.0063. Yeah? So you can enrich in each of these steps yeah, by a diffusion membrane only by one, yeah, by less than 1%. Yeah? And hence, you need this depicted cascade process to enrich uranium-238 in dozens and hundreds of steps. So now in diffusion, uh, we looked at the exclusive transport of matter. Yeah, that means uh, gas particles between reservoir 1 and reservoir 2. But gases can also transfer energy in the form of heat. Yeah? So in this case would come about if we kept reservoir 1 at a higher temperature. Uh, and reservoir 2 at a lower temperature. Yeah? So we would get then a temperature gradient yeah? uh, um, along the z-coordinate. So we can uh, express uh, um, the energy or heat flow yeah, through the plane at z0 
as equation 2.50. Yeah, so here we essentially have uh, the energy flux Ju equals uh, minus lambda times our temperature gradient dt over dz at z0. Now don't confuse the lambdas here. Yeah, this lambda here uh, is unfortunately commonly used in literature. Um, and it ref uh, this proportionality constant is also called the thermal conductivity coefficient. Yeah, so it doesn't refer to the mean free path. Okay, so now uh, let's again apply um, our general transport equation here that we met previously um, so we, uh, to, to this energy or heat flow and we essentially get expression here 2.51 so we get Ju equals du over ADT equals minus a half times the number density times the uh, mean velocity times the mean free path times du dash by dz at z0 yeah. So uh, uh, here u dash yeah, is essentially the average energy transported by a particle. Yeah? So that means we can uh, substitute for u dash yeah, u divided by Na. So the uh, energy car carried by one particle yeah, divided by the number of particles. So uh, uh, this is what we do here in the next step. So we get Ju equals minus a half times all this stuff divided by Na times du over dz. So this is our energy gradient along the z coordinate. Yeah. So now we can expand du by dz at z0. Yeah? And we do this uh, uh, by dt over delta t. Yeah? So we essentially get delta u by delta t at constant volume times uh, dt over dz at z0 yeah? and we know this expression already dt over dz at z0 is essentially our temperature gradient going from reservoir 1 to reservoir 2 along the z-axis and uh, um, we can essentially substitute this delta u over delta t at constant volume yeah, as a constant cv yeah, we get here our exp expression 2.52. Yeah. So uh, usually uh, this fraction here, yeah, 1n times Cv uh, divided by Avogadro's number is replaced by 1 Cv, yeah, which is the heat capacity of, of your gas. Yeah. So now um, compare your equation 2.52, so this entire thing, with your initial equation for the energy or heat flow. Yeah, so we essentially have the same form here, dt over dz by z0, so this is this bit, and all of this stuff is our uh, proportionality coefficient lambda. Yeah, so now we finally have an expression for this. And this is essentially our thermal conductivity coefficient lambda, which is equal to one half times one CV times the mean velocity times the uh, mean free path. Yeah, and uh, uh, this uh, thermal conductivity coefficient uh, can uh, be then measured experimentally in dependence of temperature for all kinds of substances, as we see here. Yeah, so here again, thermal conductivity lambda um, versus temperature. Yeah, for air, saturated steam, ammonia vapor, and so on. All right, so this brings us to the end of uh, the kinetic theory of gases. Um, next time, we'll be looking at phase transition and the Clapeyron equation. Yeah, this is from uh, the Frenchman Benoit Paul-Emile Clapeyron. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that how the English tongue would go about this. So if you go with Clapeyron or something like that, it's also fine as long as you understand the mathematics behind it. See you all next time.